John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27, and I'm reading. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and a disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home, and the church said, Amen. And my subject is, always take care of your mother. Always take care of your mother. Jesus had seven last words or sayings that have become a part of church history as he hung on the cross. My text verses gives us the third of these seven sayings or commonly called last words. Jesus said again, dear woman, here's your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. All throughout Jesus' ministry, he respected, validated, and cared for and about women. That's right. And he did it. He did it in a culture where women were viewed as inferior to men and marginalized as they are in some places in the world 2,000 years later. Remember, Jesus had the audacity in the fourth chapter of John to have a conversation with a Samaritan woman of ill repute. Woman that had five husbands. I've often said when I've taken this text, and it's been years when I've taken John 4, but, you know, in my mind, she had to be fine. <laughs> this chick's in court five times. And the one she with now, Jesus said, and he ain't your husband either. <laughs> and so with that, she said, I perceive that thou art a prophet. <laughs> Her reputation so shady yes. that whereas everyone else came to get their water early in the morning before it got too hot, she came after everybody had left because you know how we are. If she come where everybody else is coming, then they talking about on the set. Here she come with her cell phone. Got the nerve. Come out here. Get away from her children. So to avoid all of that, she's just simply waiting till everybody got their water. And Jesus, of course, engages in conversation with her. She's thinking about natural water, and Jesus elevates her mind to another level. I want you to know what Jesus says to this woman in John 4, verses 13 to 15. He tells her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. I believe in the Greek it is, will no, not ever thirst again. It's very strong in the Greek. It is a very emphatic sense. He said, indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And the woman said, like most of us, well, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So she still don't fully get that this is spiritual water. But by the time Jesus finishes explaining everything, to her about it. She gets so excited about the spiritual water. She leaves her j water jar that she came to get and went and told everybody about the spiritual water. I got some witnesses here today who will tell you, and those you share with us on television, we're celebrating Mother's Day here at Victory, but I know some of you also agree. When you come into contact in a real way with Jesus Christ, your whole agenda will change. Your priorities will change. She forgot what she came for because she had now encountered the fountain of living water. 
in Matthew 15 and, and 21, it's hard to me to believe that when I'm dealing with a black woman, even though the scripture is clear, because I deal with the sisters all the time, and humility is just not a common trait. I'm just sorry. Now, you know, I got to be true to my culture. And in this story, this, this woman has a daughter. Uh, she's a Syrophoenician woman, so she is implied to be black. Her daughter, the Bible says, is demon-possessed, and the daughter suffers terribly. There is nothing a mother won't do to when their child is sick. This woman comes to Jesus, and instead of the compassionate, kind Jesus we get in other places, we get an apparent cruel Jesus. Jesus said, you want me to heal your daughter? Well, she's a Gentile. I didn't come for the Jews. As I said many times, I, some sisters would have handled it okay, but others would have been like when Jesus would have told her, it ain't right to give the children food, meaning the Jews, to the dogs. I can hear some of y'all now. You may be Jesus, but you don't call me no dog. <laughs> and would have walked away. But because her daughter wasn't healed, she had to feel something about what Jesus said, but she looked over at her sick daughter. Some mothers will understand exactly what I'm saying. The humiliation and the stuff you've had to take to make sure that whatever it takes for your children to be all right. The stuff you've had to take sometime off employers who threaten you, who, who demand that you do certain wrong things to keep the job, and you realize that you in a matriarchal home may have been the only one putting food on the table and clothes on the back. You took a lot of stuff. And I'm sure this woman just, she just sucked it in. And the Holy Spirit must have moved on her to give this kind of answer. She said, but yes, Master. But even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from the table. And so her crumb faith, we talk about faith of a grain of mustard seed. Her crumb faith was enough to amaze Jesus and said, I ain't never seen no faith like this. He said, your daughter has been made whole. She went home, her daughter was healed because she humbled herself before Jesus. Understood he wasn't trying to really put her down, but that his primary mission at that point was to the Jewish nation. Jesus made an exception for her, and in many of your lives and many of your prayers, he done made some exceptions for you. It is only the women followers who refused to deserve Jesus when he went to Calvary's cross. It was the women who primarily were now at crucifixion. Mary, her sister Salome, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, risking their lives to be there with Jesus. Because they took the risk, they reaped the benefit of being with Jesus until death do us part. Mothers bring us into the world and sometimes have to painfully watch their children leave the world before them. And one of the disgraces to our community today is the number of African American children and especially our boys who leave here way too young. And so I pray for you mothers who are hurting here today because one of your children or your nephews or nieces, they're, they're not here with you today. You are certainly in all of our prayers. It's our mothers who, came, who took care of us when we couldn't take care of ourselves. As already stated during the, during the announcement, being a good mother is a 24-7 job. And I had to say good because there are some mothers, they weren't good mothers. No, I'm not naive. There are 3,500 plus members here at this church. Some people come to my office. Some of the things some of these mothers have done is incredulous. But the point that I'm trying to make here for the good mothers is a 24-7 job. Let the good mothers say amen up in here. I say it's a 24-7 job. 
a cook, a nurse, a counselor, a warden. Where you been? Didn't I tell you to be in here at this time? A chauffeur, a teacher, a friend, a maid, and even a bank. All mothers are physically challenged. They have only two hands. And let me hear you something. For a job with no pay, there is pay. It ain't money. The payoff, and I speak as a father and I know how my wife feels as being the mother of our children. The payoff, young people, who are here with your mother is when you do good with your life. That's the payoff. When all the sacrifice, all the heartache, all the pain that you went through, your children marched down the aisle and got their uh, uh, high school diploma, got their bachelor's degree. You're, you're a decent man. You're a decent woman. You're a good husband. You're a good mother. That's what makes parents say it was all work. Can I get some help out here today and on television? That's what makes it worth everything and more. You see, a mother's influence on their children can be so strong that it has been said that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And what they're trying to teach in that powerful illustration is that the mother is rocking the child, but it's her influence on the child that's going to make him be the man he'll be one day. And that child, the mother puts all her attention, all of her time, pours herself into the child. So as Mary, as Mary rocked the cradle, she really wasn't the one to rule the world. Because that baby, Jesus, the one that she was rocking, was going to one day be king of kings and lord of lords. So as she rocked the baby, she was also rocking the one that will control the world, rocking the cradle of the king of kings, the lord of lords, and the savior of the world. Give God praise up in this house. Jesus was sitting. One day he's in the cradle, and the next 33 and a half years later, he's sitting on the throne of glory yes, yes, yes. with angels bowing before him, with heaven and earth adoring him. You don't ever know, mother, what your children will become one day. I still remember when all three of my children were young, and my Aunt Dorothy, we call her Dot, she may even be here today, she's a member here, but she came to me one day in the midst when they were frustrating me. You can't be a parent and them kids not frustrate you. <laughs> it's impossible. He hit me. I didn't do it. Get it back. I remember, our kids remember, I be driving, I know it's distracted driving, but I be reaching back and see myself now. And got, got cut me a piece of thigh, and I don't, I'm pinching that thigh. Ah! Ah! I mean, now you know, I'm not, I'm not talking real life out here. <laughs> See, I knew how to make my kids get quiet without a DVD in the car. <laughs> the DVD is, is, is less painful, I get it. But brothers and sisters, 33 and a half years, since Mary had rocked the infant Jesus, now the wood of the cradle has transformed itself into the wood of the cross. Let's work with this. The interaction between Jesus and his mother is full of pathos, meaning sympathy and heartache and pain. In the midst of this heartbreaking scene where Jesus is enduring the pain and humiliation of that cross, he is thinking and caring about his mother. Based on that scene, I say to you, why must loving someone often come with such pain? 
Someone wrote a song and said, love is a hurting thing. And I've come to the realization there's no such thing as a love for anyone, children, spouses, parents, that doesn't eventually come with some pain. Can I get some mature people to face say amen and help me out? <laughs> Mary knew her son Jesus would one day be king. She knew that before he was born. All of you theologians know that. But what she did not know was that the way to the throne was by the way of the cross. God showed her how glorious her son would be, King of kings, Lord of lords, and Savior of the world. But he didn't show her the cross. So now Mary has to stand there and do the worst thing any mother has to do and watch her son die with nothing that she could do about it. But Jesus refused to leave this world without being sure his mother was going to be taken care of. So many of you, under the sound of my voice and watching on television, are you taking care of your aging parents? And some of you are enduring great stress trying to take care of your aging parents. And some of you are doing that while at the same time dealing with crazy grown-up kids of yours. I, see, that's why I miss the old school church because it used to be a time someone would have shouted out, I know that's right, Pastor. <laughs> I mean, they got a 20 or 30-year-old that's challenging them and causing all kind of issues on drugs, in the streets, babies all over the place. And on the flip side, there's their parents, sick, need help. This is the reason that sometimes the caregivers check out before the ones they're caring for. And let me tell this to you. You need to learn how to take care of yourself. Those you are taking care of others, you better learn how to take care of yourself. Let, let me get this wrapped up. It is important for us to understand the selflessness of Jesus. That where he could have been simply thinking about himself, he is concerned about his mother. Jesus entrusts the care of his mother to John for two reasons. Number one, Scripture makes it clear that Jesus simply did not believe on him until after his resurrection. And obviously his father, Joseph, is dead. Second, the apostle John was closer to Jesus than any of the other disciples. It was John that at the Last Supper was right next to him. And he was so humble, he would just say the one closest to him. He didn't want to say the one that I'm the one that Jesus loved the most. He was humble about it. But Jesus knew. Someone said, well, why would John get such favoritism? It's not favoritism. He wanted to be closer to Jesus than the rest of them. Anyone who wants to be closer to God, the Bible says, if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. Don't be jealous of somebody else's deep spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ when you can have the same relationship. Some scholars tell us that Mary may have even been his aunt. But in any event, Jesus knew that how much John loved him, that he knew John was going to take care of his mother. I, I can't name names, but I'm going through that in similar situations here at Victory where close friends of mine have gone on. And I feel a special attention to their wives because to me, I'm honoring my best friends when I honor their wives. And what I want some of you to compliment yourself on 
Because you would say, Pastor, it's not a problem for me taking care of my aging mother or father. And I would say to you, you've got the right spirit and you've got the right attitude because it is an honor and privilege to take care of the people who took care of you when you couldn't take care of yourself. It is an honor and it is a privilege. And as I close, we have a serious theological piece to deal with in my clothes, and that is Jesus calling his mother woman. Seems disrespectful on the surface. That's why you have to study it much deeper than that. One of the reasons that Jesus called, looking from the cross, and you heard it, woman, one of the reasons he did that, he didn't want to call her mother, and some of you mothers get it, that would have made Mary's pain even worse. For to watch your child on that cross die, and they cry out, mother. She might have fainted. So he calls her woman. But there's a second reason that's more important than the first, that he calls her woman. The second reason is spiritual. You see, this story is more important than always take care of your mother. It's critical, but, it, but there's a deeper point. As Jesus hung on the cross, now he was forcing Mary to see him in a way she had never seen him before. This wasn't just her son dying on the cross. This was her Savior dying on... I'm going to get some help out here. This was her Savior, not just her son. Jesus was dying for her sins just like he died for your sins and mine. So he wanted her to understand, I'm not just your son. I am your king. I am your Lord. I am your master. And as I hang on the cross, I am your Savior. And a few weeks later, we already know, on the day of Pentecost, Mary was in that upper room praying to get the Holy Ghost just like Jesus' other disciples. And as I prepared to open up the doors of the church, she could now see him as the Lamb of God. She could now see the one that John the Baptist saw and said, Behold, the one who comes, who takes away the sins of the world. In the midst of all this horror of Calvary, God's will was being carried out. Note Isaiah 53, final scripture, I believe. Note there's one more. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before his shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was a sign of grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And now verse 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord made his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring, prolong his day, and the will of the Lord will prosper in the hand of the one who went to that cross. As I prepare to give the altar call, I want you mothers, especially those who have young children, keep investing in your children. The greatest return on investment is not what you can get from a bank. The greatest return on investment is what you get from investing into the flesh of your flesh. Thank you for joining us today and we look forward to worshiping with you at either our 9 a.m. or 11:30 a.m. Sunday services that are biblically based, illustrative, contemporary, and timely. Our services cater to men, women, the young, and young at heart. We also invite you to join us for Tuesday night Bible study at 7:45 p.m. and lunch on the Word on Wednesdays at noon. 
We are so thankful for your continued support of this ministry. And if this excerpt from our service touched your heart to either give financially to the ministry or to purchase the entire worship service on either CD or DVD, please call 708-283-0383 or visit us online at www.victoryapostolicchurch.org. 